Hello, and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. And today we have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Joyce Brown, the president of the Fashion Institute of Technology, the first black and the first woman president of FIT. She was interim president of Baruch College and before that a professor of clinical psychology right here at CUNY Grad School and before that as a deputy mayor of New York City under Mayor David Dinkins. Quite an illustrious career. And right now at FIT is a groundbreaking show, Black Fashion Designers, from the 1950s to the present that runs until May 16th, so you still have time to see it. And thank you so much, Joyce, for being here today. I'm delighted to be here with you. I, I love going through your career, so many, because I remember seeing you at City Hall, you know, and you were trying <laughs> to keep the reporters at bay, you know, helping Those were David the run, <laughs> run the city. <laughs> Right, and then yeah, you went on into psychology or pursued that with a seriousness that uh, that I hadn't quite remembered because we know you so much, you know, as the public, president, right? The public right. View, yeah. No, I my my background is in psychology. Um, I always say it helps me a great deal if people behave badly. I threaten to bring in my couch, um, <laughs> but my degree is actually um, in psychology, and um, I think it helps a great deal. Helps me listen well. Right, and, uh, right. Yeah, I want to talk about that because I was reading a um, New York Times uh, corner office piece about you, and, right. and one of the things that you say is that you, you think you've got a third ear, and the interviewer was saying, well, what do you use that for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think you do develop a third ear, a different way of listening, and if you're if you're able to pay attention to that, I think it really does help in terms of providing leadership and really listening and understanding what people need and want. So. Right. Well, the, and you need that because you've got 10,000 students and almost 2,000 staff yeah. Yeah. to manage. It's, you know? Yeah, it's great. It's like running a little city. It is a but, city. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The students are just the best part of my day. They're very talented. They come from all over. Uh, and we have a very dedicated faculty and staff. People come and they stay. They, they really uh, spend their career at FIT. Right. Well, I, so the, one of your answers was there was that you know, I'm listening with that third ear for passion and for mm -hmm. the determination to succeed. And if I don't, if I don't hear it, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, you know, you have to, you have to be energized. You have to be, you know, seeking um, to reach the goals and. People who are a little too careful aren't going to really make it uh, in that environment. Ah, so it's, you're not looking for the careful ones. You're looking for the mm. bold ones. Eh? Yeah, you know, I always say that everyone talks these days about the disruptors, you know, and um, our kids are, they're talented and they're edgy uh, and they're going to be the disrupting those things that need to di be yeah. disrupted. So. I was telling you before the show started that my granddaughter and I saw the wall that your students are working on the, around yeah. FIT, which is just the most magnificent. She thought it was the most beautiful thing she'd ever seen. <laughs> when well. she went up closely and she was looking at it, she says, look at all of this. Who did it? And those are your those are our very students. talented students. Yeah, those are our illustration students. Right. Uh, we started a few years ago with this project. Um, and the students come and they have a vision and an inspiration. And what's really amazing is to see the blank wall when they begin. And then it's like the outline happens. And then they fill it in and you have this beautiful mosaic. Right. And now, of course, they're all the way down 28th Street. Wow, well, so. so get thee down to 28th Street yeah. because it's a sight to see. It's like, uh, you know, I know you have a museum there, but this is the museum. <laughs> this on is the our, out our outside Your world. outside <laughs> museum. So uh, talk to us about uh, your place in black America. Where do you fit yourself in, in black America? Well, you know, it's interesting. I grew up... Um, on Convent Avenue um, in Harlem, um, a storied location, 270 yes. Convent Avenue. People know the address. Um, and I grew up in the middle of, I mean, my playground was the City College campus. Ah. Um, you know, we would get on our roller skates and skate through the campus, and we thought big fun was to go into Shepherd Hall, you know, and make all the noise we could make on the marble floors, and the guards, of course, would chase us out. I used to <laughs> laugh to myself when I worked at CUNY, and I would go to City College for meetings, and everyone was, you know, acting like I was an important personage arriving, and I wanted to say, 
I'm the kid who was on the roller skates that skating, you used to chase, that you used to chase out of uh, <laughs> Shepherd Hall. But the inspiration, uh, when, I, when you say, how do I place myself? I think that, you know, my parents, the thing they said to my sister and I continually was, you have to get a college education. You are going to college, dead or alive, you're going to college. Did they, uh, did they go? No, or were you no. the first? We were the first. And mm -hmm. um, it would be a life changer. I mean, that was always the message. It was transformative. You must do that. It makes a difference in the choices you will have in your life. Um, so growing up in the middle of City College, or on the perimeter of City College, I would see hundreds and hundreds of students streaming down Convent Avenue through the arches of City College. I mean, anywhere we went was to that same subway. I knew where they were coming from. They were right. coming from 145th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. They would come up the hill and they would be streaming down Convent Avenue. So it must be something really important, <laughs> right? It wasn't just my parents that right. thought this was important. And then from our windows, um, because we used to live at 260 before we lived at 270. I could look out the window into the labs. Ah. Now I had no idea what they were doing. I thought they went there to play with fire because ah. they had Bunsen burners. Right, right. They wore masks and they I wore lab coats. Bunsen burners. Bunsen burners. Bunsen right. burners. Imagine we're dating <laughs> right. ourselves probably. I don't know. Um, but I had no idea. They right. looked like they were all coming there and doing these incredible things. So. I place myself really with uh, firmly in the world of and the importance of education mm -hmm. and understanding our place uh, to, to really make a difference in lives. I never wanted to be a teacher. I didn't think that was my gift. I still don't think it's my gift. Mm -hmm. I think what I'm able to do is to provide an environment where uh, the teaching and learning can be dynamic and people can flourish. Um, and I think that was the lesson. Uh, that was really. The I just lesson love for the me. story. The kid who was roller skating in the yeah <laughs> at City College is right. now is now running her own college. Yeah. I, th I, I love that. You know who told us uh, a similar story recently was Faith Ringel, yes. who also lived in the area. Before, Did she go into City College too? Yes, she <laughs> went. She went to City College, but she saw those same quote people going to the subway or going to the classes and whatever. But they were all men at that point. Ah. So, you know, her perspective was, where are those guys going? Ah. So she got in, she had to talk her way in to an education. They still were not, they were not accepting Interesting. women in. Interesting. But just being around the, the university, the college, was stimulation yeah. enough. You saw people who had purpose. Interesting, and yeah. Isn't it interesting? I mean, there it stands. It's so statuesque, the whole place, the campus is really, the, the old architecture is so beautiful. And, you know, it's just exuding this influence on young people's lives. Very right. important. So now speaking of influence on young people's lives and on everybody's lives, you've got this fashion show. Yes. How did, how did that come about? Well, you know, I think the, the inspiration really was to create an opportunity for people to understand the impact of, of black fashion designers on the industry. You know, there were a few storied names, you know, that people were familiar with, uh, but there are many, many uh, black fashion designers that are, are not known but have had a tremendous influence. So um, the curators wanted to um, encourage interest and perhaps greater scholarship. Uh, they wanted to be able to celebrate the various ways in which uh, black fashion designers have influenced. So, you know, it's, there's sort of themes throughout the show. Um, you know, among them, you know, the evening wear or the street wear or men's wear. Uh, you know, just ways in which um, uh, the direction we're familiar with in the industry was influenced by these, uh, by these individuals laboring uh, in the, in the and I right. and I missed it. I'm still going to go, but I think there was a huge snowstorm the night. I think so. <laughs> yes, yes, the, the yes. opening. Yes, right at the at the uh, at the opening. So I have my heart set on on walking through it. But what I see online, and for people should know that you can go yeah. uh, online and see much of it. And I love when you said the scholarship. I love that piece about it. That that it's not only the uh, dresses you're talking about, the designers, but also the models yes. and also the fashion fairs, like the Ebony Fashion Fair and the 
author, you know, the, the fashion journalists. Yes. So it's this whole universe of fashion it's where... The, yeah, the impact on the whole industry. Right, where we've had played a part, not a big part, because it's still somewhat uh, exclusive. Limited, yeah, but, you know, interestingly, I think probably uh, the part we've played isn't even understood because it's subtle yeah. and it's in the background. And, of course, there are people who then build on the influence that... Um, these designers have been able to uh, start. Um, but yes, there's, you know, for where there are people making choices about who gets elevated, who gets celebrated, uh, you're, you know, there's still some obstacles to overcome. Yeah, I think 1% of the uh, designers who are in, is it Vogue runway, yeah. the covering the, the fashion weeks, that that it's 1% uh, of those designers. Are. Yeah. Are African American. Are African American. So yeah. still, and that's now, still a long way to go. This one of the stories that I love is the, is the designer who created Jackie Kennedy's wedding yes. dress. Yes. Yeah. Uh, her, her last name is Lowe. Is it Ann Lowe? Who? Yes. Who? Yeah. Uh, apparently, did Jackie Kennedy actually refer to her as that colored woman? Oh. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Is that part of the book? <laughs> there's. You know, I mean, but of course we're talking about the, you know, 50s, 60s, you know, so anything is possible. Anything but is she, possible. But she, so there she so was. So talented. Oh, my goodness. Incredible. Yeah. And you've got some of her things there. The interesting thing is, is, is that all of these have come from your permanent collection uh, of, like, what, 50,000? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they work very hard pieces at building that you have. the archives. Um, and it's, you know, we call it... Uh, going through the closet when uh, people want to come <laughs> down and we organize some, you know, on occasion, a tour to see what some of the holdings are. Um, and, and continually uh, we work to keep it vital and current and, you know, the kinds of things that scholars really do need to know about. Right, so. right. Well, I saw, re I was reading your student magazine and they were talking, there was some famous person who was donating her clothing uh, to to the fashion oh, yeah. institute. Oh yeah, we get you know. many donations. You know, some things we, we go, there's auctions all over the world that, uh, you know, when there are pieces that we think fill uh, a gap in our holdings, we will participate in. But um, many times people will, you know, donate their clothing. People have made tremendous investments in designer clothing and at some point they need to get space for more things or or they just know they're not going to wear them anymore. Right. Um, you know, of course, we're limited by space. We can't always take everything right. that people uh, want to offer us. So it's really a matter of um, filling in mm -hmm. uh, the collection that we have so that it tells a story because it really, it's a teaching vehicle. The museum is certainly a museum for the world. We have over 100,000 visitors that come through in the course of a year. Right. Uh, but we have many, many right. student groups. We have our own students. Uh, and um, so it really is an educational tool, yes. and we think of it that way. Right, so that is the museum at, the, yeah. uh, at FIT. We have a couple of clips I want to play. Andre Leon Talley, uh, who is the wonderful... Yes. What shall we call Persona. him? Persona. <laughs> Persona. <laughs> he's at Vogue, but he, I mean, you know, you're not it unless he says you are, right? So uh, uh, he's, he's been a good friend, yes. He's talking here to Tracy Reese, a designer, about yes. race. Let's, let's take we a We have a little video that. in the museum collection. Please. Right, yeah. Yes. Let's take a look. You know, in terms of race, you know, I always, for me, it's to my benefit, it can never, um, be a detraction from me achieving mm -hmm. goals. And goals. so I never really mm -hmm. um, thought of my race as a problem. It's a problem. I have to see it as an asset. As an it asset. It makes me who yes. I am. And, makes um, you special. Makes me Good special experience. and it colors all my experiences yes, yes. and also my inspiration. Um, so I always saw it as an asset. Someone else might have thought differently and maybe something didn't come my way because of it. But if it didn't, it wasn't meant to be mine. Well, and I always want whatever Leon is wearing, you know? <laughs> I mean, I, who's, who designed that? 
But you know, the other young lady there, Mimi Plange, is yes. uh, really an up-and-coming designer, very talented right. as well. Right, pieces of We have this. some of her things right. in the exhibit as well. Yeah, so that is that is encouraging. And now the whole idea of, uh, of, of modeling black models, who they could and could not be and what they could and could not look like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a clip with uh, Robin Givan, who is this wonderful fashion journalist, yes. culture journalist. She's uh, talking to... Uh, model Veronica Webb. So let's uh, take a look at that. And then advertising is like the sugar plum of modeling. That's where the money is. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest thing to get to. It took me probably 12 years of my career, like working every day on every run, proving myself on every runway, flying all over the world, proving myself in every kind of editorial, working in every kind of condition uh, to and you know over and over again publishing great pages and still for very much of my career it was they don't really like people of color in advertising no one really wants to use someone black in their ads so sorry you know and, we love you but we can't people that blunt about it i mean people we talk yes. about shifts in the way that people deal with race and how it becomes more subtle so that has changed a little bit uh but not completely we yeah. we still have we still have those barriers. Well, yes, there are. You know, it's interesting. The other person in there is Beth yes. Ann Hardison, yes. who, of course, you know, can truly tell the story of the historical evolution. Sitting in the of, center, yes, yeah, she was the... using uh, African American models and really sort of fighting for the rights of uh, these beautiful women to be counted among the beautiful women. Um, so, I think. Certainly things have changed since yes. then, but, you know. We're, you're working on it. We're all working on it. We're all on working it, on but, it, but and we're, you know, continually pushing forward. And, you know, I always say you can't legislate good behavior. I mean, mm -hmm. if people harbor these feelings, the only, what we can do is create the opportunities, prepare the young people as the best we can and the best they can be, and then they have to get out there and compete. Right, right. So now you're you're preparing them. Yeah. Again, ten thousand students, almost two thousand staff. Uh, the completion rate uh, is astonishing because everybody talks about uh, kids dropping out of school and not getting their degrees. And yeah, and not, you, not at FIT. At FIT, it's like ninety percent. Well, ninety percent. Uh, well, yeah, we are in, in the ninety percentile of, in terms of completion, but the important statistic for some people, is also that job placement. Mm -hmm. I mean, when these young people graduate, they're out there looking for them to give them jobs. We have a very strong internship program. Mm -hmm. And I always say the employers come and they shop. You know, they bring the, the young people in for internships, which is part of their program. We uh, supervise that. We incorporate it in their educational experience. And so upon graduation, those employers know what they have, and they have really uh, inculcated the uh, atmosphere and environment of that workplace, mm -hmm. and, they, and they want to hire them. So the students coming out with a bachelor's degree um, are about 90% get have a job at graduation, and the uh, students that are in the associate degree, the two-year programs, we probably have over 70% of those getting mm -hmm. jobs as well. Many of those students, of course, go on and, and complete their four-year degree in yeah. the market today. And, and, and are there kids of color who are choosing uh, the, the, the life in the arts? Uh, sometimes I feel that they, many of our children feel that they don't have that option, you know. Of, but once... Uh, have, hearing about your placement rate, I would say. <laughs> well, that, yes, but you know, when you say the youngsters don't see a place for themselves, I think that one of the places that we almost as a society don't do what we should do is expose those young people uh, early on mm -hmm. in, in grade school, in high school to the arts. You know, it's very competitive to get into FIT, and if a, if a young person hasn't had exposure to the arts and have, has the ability to produce a portfolio so that they, yes. the faculty so know K, how to evaluate them. K through them. 12. Where? Yeah, K through 12 and, and 12 through, you know, sure. beyond in, into the high school years. Um, so all of those, those schools in, in struggling neighborhoods that no longer have arts programs and who can't, yeah, you know, Yeah, it's a great service to the young, talented 
people and the young kids in those right. communities. We have a pre-college program that we run mm -hmm. uh, and it's very popular. It was so popular that the parents said you have to do something for the younger children because these kids are coming home and talking about what a great time they had. So now in the summer we have the uh, pre-college program so they have to be you know 13, 14, I'd say till you know 16-ish and then we have the intermediate school so it is too adorable in the summer they're all little, you know we have right. you know a couple of thousand kids that come through there and it's not expensive but anything is expensive if you don't have any money mm -hmm. and so we try and raise uh, money for scholarships to get a, a bigger outreach to kids of color. For right, that. so SUNY, uh, FIT is a SUNY school yes. so we can assume that the tuition is much lower than it than it is in private colleges, so yes. that that's, that, you know, that's an asset. It, yes, it is. I mean, you know, depending upon uh, if you're a New York City resident, or I should say a New York State resident, you have an in-state rate. If you, it doesn't matter if you live in Taiwan or Teaneck, New Jersey, it's an out-of-state student, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a multiple of three, you know, three times the in-state rate for out-of-state students. And that's because you know, as a public uh, institution, we are subsidized. So it's uh, the subsidy is really for the uh, residents of, of the state. But it's still, you know, I mean, when you make the comparison to private institutions, mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, out off the charts. Uh, and, the, and the students really get a wonderful education yeah. throughout yes. the SUNY system. As, as I was reading through your, your literature for the, for the students, they, they had made note of how many of them come from other countries. It's a huge, you, you said yeah. 70 countries, yeah. and from South Korea alone, I think it's 330 students. Yeah, that, the, the Korean population is, uh, is very high in our international student uh, population, and I think there's a lot of focus in Korea on fashion. Sure. Um, anyway, yes, we have probably 11% of our student mm -hmm. body is international. They come from Mongolia, they come from Europe, they come from Asia, they come from all yeah. over. It's a real destination. Right, and we were talking a bit about the immigration issues that we were having and that the SUNY itself and the larger, uh, its larger universe had some students who were stopped, yeah. Uh, yeah. not able to get back in the country after they uh, the went, went home. The maelstrom that hit suddenly right. out of nowhere. Yeah. We were fortunate. We didn't have students who were who had traveled uh, and were trying to get home. But I think there's a certain level of nervousness, uh, you know, both from the parents and from the students. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, you hate to see that because it interferes with why they're sure, here. Sure, sure. Um, but your staff, uh, you have a, sta a we staff have, that uh, is dealing with that directly. Absolutely. Sure. We, have, we have set up uh, an international student support service right. area. We have a dean in that area. And, um, and we really try and nurture and make the students feel a part of the community. It's very hard, you know. Think about it, to go... You know, I wouldn't do very well needing to learn a new language right, and study sure. and manage to, uh, you know, hold my own and be a presence in a classroom. So we try and uh, anticipate what some of those needs are, and um, we're building programmatically on doing things that help to make the students feel comfortable and at home. So how do you perceive the future of, uh, of the art world? I know the word sustainability comes up a lot in... How do I see the future of the, what I'm the sorry? future of art? Is oh, it, of art. Uh -huh. Is it is it uh, changing? Uh, yes, it's well. You know, we have um, almost fifty majors, mm -hmm. and um, we have a school of business. We have a school of art and design. We have a school of liberal arts. Uh, we have a graduate school, um, and everything is changing. The world we are in is changing. Mm -hmm. The way we communicate, the way we teach and learn, receive information, express. Uh, our artistic muse. Um, and so one of the things we've been doing um, is we have been trying to, through our strategic planning, really identify the ways in which we might be more interdisciplinary, uh, where, you know, we, we have a very big focus on the liberal arts. I'm a big proponent of the liberal arts. I think it's, it teaches students how to uh, think critically, how to conceptualize, how to analyze things. I always say to them, you have to try and think of the answers to questions no one's asking yet, 
because that's how fast it's moving and they need to apply what they learn. So um, we have been working uh, to try and uh, create opportunities for faculty to work together, to create research opportunities for the students. Um, and really, we're working to build an innovation center. And in that innovation center, I want people to come for creative solutions for uh, either the products that they're making and developing and building or improving, uh, and to create opportunities for the students to get a hand in on what the future the of future? those artistic expressions and right. creative industries are going to produce. So, Well, as, as we always come to the close of an interview, and I can't believe we're there already, My but <laughs> <laughs> we need another session, Doctor. <laughs> um, we always ask our guests to finish the statement, the strength, the power of black America lies in. How would um, you? I would say the strength and power of black America lies in its people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it, it's the strength and the resilience and the courage um, the adaptability, and, and I think the defiance, you know, just the defiance. When you think of what our ancestors mm. have, were able to achieve in the face of incredible, incredible obstacles and give us the spirit to continue and to pass on, you talk about your grandchildren, you inspire them mm. to f continue to push and to uh, make a success of their lives, I think it's the people. I mean, it would have been so easy for everyone to sort of uh, lie low and say this is our fate, but no, we didn't believe it. We didn't believe it. We didn't believe it. Well, so, that's... I always say I want, I want our kids to come out and break some glass and make a difference. Break so. some glass. You're <laughs> looking for that passion. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Dr. Joyce Brown, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It was a pleasure. I'm going to come see the show, and I'm going to come and look at that wall again. Oh, yes, you must. <laughs> and we'll give you a private tour of the show. Oh, excellent. Well, thank you. See, I know people. Right? <laughs> thank you out there as well for joining us today as we have this conversation with Dr. Joyce Brown. We will see you again the next time on Black America.